apologies from Councillor Marie Lafiso and Councillor Chris Staines, and one for Councillor Newell, who is leaving at two and may decide not to be here for much of the meeting. You'll, oh, you'll come back, so he's, he, he'll be away for some time. I'll move those seconded. Councillor Lord, thank you. Any discussion? All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. The next item isn't as clear cut as it should be, confirmation of agenda. There are two matters. One is the normal, um, and I'm happy to move, that we confirm the addition with the addition of a matter called Otago Polytech, and I will thank Councillor um, Hawkins for bringing this to my attention and the news of the last week um, of a review of the Polytech situation. That decision is coming out this week. I have circulated to you a proposed motion um, that would come sit under that, which my understanding is the issue is a major issue and it's therefore I can as Chair ask to have this matter added to the agenda with the consent of the Council and um, it would be simply moving that which isn't so much, it's consistent with all of the policies and therefore I don't think requires a report. So that's my way of, uh, and having taken considerable um, advice on it, the process through. So I'm moving two things. One is that we um, add Otago Polytechnic to the agenda and secondly that we um, do that usual resolution of 2.1 option C in the standing orders. Any second to thank you, Councillor Hawkins? Any discussion? All in favour, please say aye. 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 Any against? I've, it's on your, it was on your table. Oh, that, okay, sorry, I was looking at that. So, thank you, that, we'll do that as the last item. <coughs> yep. Thank you. Uh, declarations of interest. Members are reminded of the need to stand aside from decision making when a conflict arose, arises between their role as an elected representative and any private or external interest they might have. Does anyone wish to note any changes to the agenda, uh, to the uh, declaration of interest? That being the case, I'll move that the committee notes the elected members' interest register and confirms the proposed management plan for the elected members' interests. Seconded, Councillor New uh, sorry, Councillor O'Malley. All in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Part A reports. Public-private boundary on three waters networks and interim stormwater management. Thank you, Mr. Dyer and. No one to tag in with you today? No, both, both my staff members have uh, got interviews to conduct today. Thank you. Um, do you wish to address any matters in the, the long but very clear report? <laughs> um, no, I think we'll just go straight to questions. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as you know, um, one, one, this issue has been one that I've um, touched the edge of because of complaints from residents in a property in Peter Street, which has been raised with you, uh, where the situation is that a private drain runs from the road reserve under their property into a park or some such, uh, and they have no access to the drain. There's been toing and froing and concerns and so on and large uh, quoted expense for repair, but it appears to me that given they have no access nor any interest in access to that stormwater drain, uh, they should have no concern about uh, the property and if, about the drain's blockage and should the city wish to have that reinstated, um, then the city would be welcome to pay for it. Is that a, a fair assessment of, of the situation? Uh, I think what you've highlighted there is one of the key flaws in some of our existing policies. Um, so this, this, the policy as it stands for that particular property is that the pipe is um, privately owned from uh, boundary to boundary. Um, so when it's and within a roadway, it's owned by our transport network, and when it's within a private property owners. Okay. Uh, so the property private property owned owners um, own the pipe. They do, they don't wish to repair it. So is there a problem with it? Uh, yes, so uh, any, so in that particular case, uh, if any, the blockage were left in place for a very long period of time, it's likely that it's going to cause further degradation of the pipe, and that might in turn uh, result in uh, land subsidence and, and um, potentially property damage and, or, or even potentially road damage upstream. Um, 
So uh, leave, leaving it as it is <coughs> is not necessarily... If, if the property owner who owns the pipe decided therefore to block the pipe at the ingress end, that would obviate that risk? Uh, yes, it would. It would also be in contradiction with the ORC regional plan water um, and would require a resource consent which would unlikely be granted. I look forward to the discussion of the paper. Uh, I'm going to take Councillor Newell because I know he's going to have to rush off shortly before I take other councillors who preempted him. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just quickly, um, how many of these situations are we looking at across the city, roughly, and the financial implications? Uh, so the, <coughs> in terms of the um, the immediate um, uh, work that we're looking to looking to deliver, uh, without a significant policy change. Uh, We've, we've put a nominal budget in of $3.5 million uh, for, to, to remedy um, as many of the, the current issues as we, as we possibly can, but that won't, that won't deal with all of them. Um, the, in terms of the wider implications, um, the best indication I can give is that the replacement cost of our stormwater network is give or take $350 million. Um, and the rough water replacement cost at our last estimate of the uh, watercourse network within the city is, uh, is about 300, 350 million as well. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks, Tom. There's, and apologies, I can't find it quickly, but there's mention in the paper of the option currently available to uh, properties that are affected through no fault of their own, essentially taking um, legal recourse through civil litigation. Um, my question is, from a legal point of view, if we adopt a policy that approaches this issue more proactively, do we uh, take on any of that legal risk if the works programme we implement to give effect to that change in policy um, doesn't hit those properties in time? Uh, I don't, so it, I can't answer that uh, in, in any level of detail, but uh, what I would suggest is if we were to uh, take on any of these problems and construct something to, to achieve an outcome, um, we'd be constructing it to a, uh, a modern and current standard, um, so the likelihood of any uh, issues after that was built would, would be very, very low. Um, in terms of your question around whether or not we'd be transferring liability, I'm, no, I'm not sure, um, and we'd have to. Um, that would be a part of what this review would look to um, understand. And and will the review also cover um, options around cost recovery for something? And there's a there's a full gamut of um, pathways that we've ended in a difficult situation, and some are easier to take pity on than others, um, and some are just challenges around coordinating. Um, a block of residents to deal with something, in which case, you know, it's perfectly, um, well, is it um, an, an option to be able to recover those costs through rating methods or otherwise? Uh, so that would be one of the options that would be outlined in that wider policy review. Um, yes, certainly, uh, as well as change in policy options, there's, there's a, probably a plethora of um, uh, funding options as well. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr Dyer, um, could you just clarify the $3.5 million that we've got on the annual plan draft budget, which we, we decided in May, that's the $3.5 million you're referring to for stormwater renewals? Yeah. So that's the first step in this process for the interim work? Uh, so we have been undertaking some interim, interim work already. I think you heard from the Shemanskis before, and, uh, and there are a number of others where we've started uh, undertaking design reports and that sort of thing. So that, that is a cost and expense. Um, uh, so that's not part of the 3.5 million? No, it's not. It's the 3.5 million to be budgeted next year, but we have, we have allocated some funds from this year to start working on this. So my next question is around the 19, the figure of 19 projects mentioned. Do either of the two case studies we were given today, uh, are they either of them in that 19, accounted for in that 19 projects? Yeah, correct, they do, yeah. They both? They both sit within that, yeah. So final question is, if that $3.5 million is signed off in May, and if this we vote to go for option one. What's the time frame for the rollout? Uh, so we will continue working on a number of those uh, a number of those issues 
now. Um, uh, but there is, and, and ensure that a lot of the lead up work um, can be conducted before that big expense hits in terms of construction or whatever that might be. Um, so we're still working on it, um, but that having that money available uh, through the annual plan process will so certainly got, unlock a lot of gateways. You've got some preparatory work done that you can get in off the blocks really fast to yep. carry it on depending on the decision today. Correct. Excellent. Thank you very much. The Lord. I just had a question, just thinking back to the example that uh, Councillor Benson Pope gave. But some of these private drains that um, people don't know that they've been there historically for a long, long time, is there a possibility that some of those have been put in by older boroughs? Is there any possibility that councils previously did own these? Or um, are we quite confident that in these particular cases they, are, they have been put in by private citizens or perhaps groups of them to drain particular areas combined? Uh, yes, so normally um, normally the record keeping with these things is quite clear. So there's typically a building consent on the property for, for the install of uh, for the install of a private drain. Um, e even stuff going back decades? Yeah, yep. yep. Yeah, even so back to, I think I've seen record, records from the 50s and 60s and, and prior to that as well. Yep, OK, thank you. Councillor O'Malley? Thanks for this report, Tom. Um, I've got a few questions around public expectations and boundaries just sort of to set, I think, where we're heading forward. Um, you note on point three that sometimes um, some extensions can go into the middle of the road, um, a length of pipe in the road, actually. A, a, dweller may, a dwelling may be served, say, with a sewer pipe that goes into the road. Generally, I would say that the public's expectations, they would have thought that, in fact, the boundary was the boundary line. So is that one of the expectations that we're facing as we go forward? Yeah, correct. So um, yeah, we typically find um, ratepayers surprised when we mention that they may own a pipe within the roadway, um, and it's a, a long-standing policy of council um, and the Dunedin Drainage and Sewage Board prior to to the formation of Dunedin City Council. Um, and what we're proposing here is to review those policies and ensure that we come back with something that is in line with uh, council's expectation and. and um, therefore ratepayers as well. And then what we're facing is basically um, there's a fair amount of infrastructure out there which is currently in private hands. Would you be able to give a sense of the extent to which it's been maintained? Is it maintained at the same level that we're maintaining it at or do you think a lot of it, I guess this is leading, is actually under maintained and we're now starting to sort of see end of life failures coming? Uh, yeah, that's probably a Fair statement. So, um, uh, a lot of the um, Dunedin City uh, drainage network is, um, especially foul drainage network, is, is very old, um, uh, and the the housing and, and therefore lateral pipes that, that join into um, those pipes are roughly the same age. Um, so, so there is an, there is that consideration. Um, typically, they're assets that don't require a lot of maintenance, um, uh, but when they fail. Um, they require a pretty significant intervention. Um, uh, what we've found is that in a number of cases, um, property owners spend qu quite a sum of money uh, replacing a, a lateral pipe out to, through the road and to their um, uh, to the to the wastewater pipe in the road. Um, something that we can, you know, typically if we're renewing the, a wastewater pipe, um, and we could carry out that work at the same time, we could do it for a lot less, um, uh, forty to fifty percent less. And do we have stormwater systems that may have been laid down a long time in the past that are interacting with our own stormwater systems? So we've got a mixture of private and public ownership of a pipe network that we're relying on as a public good outcome? Yeah, that's correct. So just one last thought going forward. You say that we have a $350 million stormwater asset structure. How roughly big do you think this private stormwater structure might be? relative to that. Is that included in that or is that on, that'll be on top of that? Uh, so I think in our last valuation, our stormwater network was valued around the 350 mark and um, the last time we made an attempt at valuing the, um, uh, the watercourse network, it was about the same value, um, but with significant margins of error on it. But that's our one, right? Or is that, everybody, is that ours and the private combined? Uh, so 350 for ours uh, and then an additional three. Oh, so you're calling the watercourses Anything it could be a pipe under the ground. Yep. Okay. So that's the, the so basically the private component 
is around about the same size as our current component. For stormwater, yes. Correct. And that's what we'll be going forward with as we consult with the public, is how to deal with that. Uh, so we'd like to start with a number of options, because there are many different ways to handle um, mm. to handle this uh, particular issue, but we'd start with a number of options and um, hopefully end up at an end point. That right, so we're starting at an open-ended place and then moving forward from there. Correct. Great, thank you. Councillor Elder. Chair, and thank you for the report. Um, is there a, um, a, it seems perceived, but is there an increase in the number of these kind of incidents? We had two people today talking to us. Uh, it's hard to say. Um, uh, there, there have been a number of these types of issues um, in the past, going back decades, um, uh, all dealt with in different ways, um, which, which is one of the things that we're trying to resolve by undertaking a broader policy review. Um, however, in recent times with significant storm events, um, uh, which I think we've all um, all observed, uh, it's certainly um, brought the issue more to a head. Um, it's encouraging to hear that planned um, infrastructure upgrades could reduce those costs 40 to 50 per cent. How would we be able to do that or put that into operation if we knew something was coming up? Uh, so, for instance, with that example, um, we, when we renew a, a wastewater pipe uh, in the roadway, um, we, if we planned to re renew all of the lateral pipes in that roadway at the same time, um, it would mean one period of disruption, um, one period of excavation, um, with the ability to alter and change things to, uh, to fit quite nicely, um, yeah. whereas in, in a situation where a landowner is just renewing that pipe, uh, that they have their own corridor access requests, their own um, uh, uh, establishment costs in terms of getting a digger on site to, to do that work, and then um, and f further costs as well. Um, so we'd be talking about being able to reduce that by um, undertaking works on mass. So it would be less ad hoc but more, and more planned? Yeah, correct with street upgrades. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Vandervis. The long-standing policy that you refer to regarding where the responsibility lies with uh, maintenance of pipes, um, you have said that you're going to review this and you're going to come back with, uh, there's going to be something that you're going to come back with is the something that you're going to come back with going to be a clear delineation of responsibility along land ownership boundaries? That is to say, if it's in the road reserve, it's a DCC responsibility, and if it's on private property, then it's a private property. Because I think the existing um, long-standing policy is counterintuitive. Do you anticipate that this is what you're going to come back with? Uh, it would certainly be one of the options, and I'd suggest a good one. Okay, the 3.5 million that's been brought forward to address many but not all of the current drainage issues, do you have a budget figure that would address all of the drainage issues that you are, or that your department is currently aware of? I don't have that figure to hand at the moment, um, largely because some of those issues haven't made it past a sort of a concept options um, stage, so we haven't started thinking about what the, the fix might be. Um, and in a lot of cases, um, the more time you spend working on these things, the more complication and, uh, and, and trouble you find. So um, at this stage, we think 3.5 is a deliverable um, figure that will address a significant number of issues, but um, uh, we can't say that it will fix everything. To deliver uh, or to fix all of the issues, uh, most of which are historical. Um, do you anticipate that a much larger than 3.5 million figure is required? Could it go to 10 million, or, or would it just be guessing at this stage because you I, don't have I, the information? I would simply be guessing, yeah, sorry. Would a much larger than 3.5 million brought forward enable you to deal with some of these issues more quickly? Not at this stage. So, if we were to if we were to bring forward further money, uh, we'd also need to think about resourcing um, the people to spend the money um, and a few other things. And it's, it's it wouldn't just be as simple as upping the budgets. Um, 
has this to do with availability of contractors or availability of super, suitable staff in the DCC? Staff. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Councillor Hall, did I miss you out? I think, apologies. Sorry, you had a question for this. Apologies. I think I've mistaken H for Hawkins instead of Hall. Apologies. That's all right. <laughs> with, with your stormwater going through private properties, are you looking at putting legal easements over the properties once you take them over or leaving them as a drain creating its own easement? Uh, so typically we uh, undertake the practice of uh, getting in a formal easement over the property. Because that, that could create more, more problems for the landowner because they couldn't even put a driveway on top of that pipe without getting consent. So it could lead to a whole lot of costs for people that's unnecessary because a drain creates its own easement, so it's a drain. Um, so with things like driveways, we're, we are very flexible um, with driveways being across easements. Um, but when it comes to things like uh, the want to build a, a garage or structure, um, a deck, for instance, um, where that might uh, impact access to the pipe, then we um, typically exercise the rights of those easements. Yeah, because that, that could be one downside of doing a lot of that stuff, because the extra cost it's going to cost the landowner to do stuff on his property. I think the question is that will come out in the options paper, presumably. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hall. Councillor Wiley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Tom, you gave us some good examples, and reading through them, is, do you have a clear pathway on how to deal with these, or is it going to be case by case? Uh, are you referring to the short-term interim work or the, the longer-term So, for review? example, on page 29, you've got an example where um, seven individual land parcels with 29 titles, uh, and there's a 140-metre private water main. Uh, we don't have a clear pathway to rectify that immediately. That would come out in the, under the wider policy review, but the pathway to deliver the policy review is clear. Okay. So when you look at um, issues like this, how are other councils around the country dealing with it? How are they, what's their process? Uh, it's a wide range, um, okay. but typically, uh, typically the public-private ownership uh, boundary is as close to an individual property as possible. Okay. So... Does any council have a method that would sort of streamline what we're trying to do and to ensure that we get all the property owners, like in this case there's 29 customers, um, to come together and act on it with urgency rather than trying to herd cats? Uh, it's a really hard question to answer. So typically the... Typically, the policies that are working the best in terms of um, uh, getting outcomes across the country at the moment are ones where uh, the, the boundary between um, public and private network infrastructure is as close to a single property as possible. So by, by doing that, you eliminate the need to, uh, to, to use your phrase, herd cats. OK. So, sorry, I'm just trying to get clarity in my mind. So, for example, if this is going nowhere and there's urgency by count, as council sees it to ensure for the betterment of the community to actually get a private contractor and to actually do the work and then claim back the costs afterwards? Uh, again, that'll be another, uh, there'll be an option within this review. Um, so the, the examples you see there are um, uh, have a level of urgency against them, but but are, can be managed in ways at the moment that are less efficient. Um, over time, we're looking to adjust our, uh, provide a policy review that gives the opportunity for council to adjust its policies um, and therefore eliminates the need for those um, less efficient processes at the moment. Okay. Just a sideline question. How far along are we in the Three Waters um Street project, uh, you know, we've done forty percent of the streets that are around the city. Is it? So I don't have that number to hand. Um, okay, so you, because you, what I'm getting at is, you referred to in some cases it can save the uh, the residents up to fifty percent if the work can be done at the same time. So have you got projects that you can see that are highlighted 
in the workflow that we're three waters have yet to go but are scheduled to go? So over the next 30 years, I think something like 70% of um, Dunedin's piped infrastructure um, will, will need to be replaced. Yeah. Um, so we, the time is right to, to get these sorts of decisions uh, or to undertake these sorts of reviews and make sure that we uh, have the right policy pathways in place. For the betterment of the residents as well? Correct, yeah. yeah. Um, and then um, I guess the other thing in reading this report is a lot of residents may fix the issue as they see it, but the consistency and quality of the fix is not up to what would work in the best interest of the community. Yeah, correct. That's that's typically the case. So um, uh, we undertake a whole lot of practices to ensure public health and um, and public safety, especially in our drinking water network. Um, and um, when you have uh, private property owners sometimes undertaking that work themselves, um, it can be can present a risk. Okay. So one final question: uh, in the financial considerations, just recapping on the numbers you. Um, talked about earlier. So basically the the last estimate of replacement cost of private water co courses was 350 million and the replacement cost of private wastewater laterals situated in the road is around 315 million. So using that, is that a pretty good estimate or is it a... Uh, they're very broad estimates. So the review we'll undertake will provide a um, much more detailed and accurate cost costing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Gary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Dyer, would it be true to say that each of the cases you're dealing with are quite individual and there's different set of situations? It isn't just as simple as coordinating a group of people. Would that be true? Yeah. Yes, broadly. And, um, and would it also be true to say that many of them are around a much, much wider catchment? So you look at catchment um, projects as opposed to a... A property project would that be fair? A fair assessment. Yeah, it's also correct. Yeah, cool. Um, and just, I just wanted to tease out that issue about the records. Are you aware that some places, I'm thinking of Peninsula, for example, where the records actually were lost at a particular point, so there aren't always records for everywhere, is there? Uh, no, there's not always records for everywhere. Um, by and large, uh, you have them. Yeah, yeah they are yeah, there. Cool. And finally. Um, a question around, just to tease out a wee bit more this point around climate change, with climate change we all know that we can expect more weather events. Can you talk about um, the three, if, if you were to spend, if, if the $3.5 million is approved uh, and we approve this recommendation in this report for option one, what would be the benefits to, to the, the public stormwater system, the $350 million asset, of sorting out these some of these projects, some of these issues, these public-private issues? How would it benefit the public stormwater asset? Uh, so all of, all of the water courses within the city eventually discharge or are discharged into um, by the stormwater network. So it's a, um, it's a broad general statement. Um, they, by having fit-for-purpose watercourse infrastructure in between fit-for-purpose stormwater infrastructure, you end up with a fit-for-purpose fit network, and what we what we don't have at the moment, or what we have at the moment, is a number of weak points um, that are, um, are privately owned. If, if those weak points were shored up, um, then the performance of the broader catchment would be much better. Um, uh, typically, we see... Uh, symptoms like overland flow um, during heavy rainfall events and that sort of thing. Um, overland flow, uh, if it starts to um, starts to push along a road on mass, is actually quite difficult to get back into pipe networks. Um, uh, if we can prevent that initially by having fit for purpose infrastructure on and the private side as well, then um, should make a so real difference. If I was, thank you. If I was to describe it as a win-win, that would be a, a reasonable assessment of the correct effect on the public system. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you. Um, what, I, I've got a couple of questions. One is um, the renewals and I exchanged emails with you and whether one of the criteria should be about avoiding, um, sorry, about the ability for the council to contribute um, to, while they're doing renewals in order, not, not understanding yet the financial ramifications for that, it would appear that it would be stupid not to do this while we're doing renewals. Um, and having a chance, a possibility later on to look at financials. So I'm just wondering whether we should incorporate that as another seven or G, depending on which... Yeah. You've given us two options on that. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> um, 
Uh, yes, I, I, I don't see any problem with that, and um, certainly uh, that's a practice we'd undertake as, as a matter of course anyway. Um, but um, I don't see, uh, I see a you know, potential to have that in the paper and it would be fine. But what it may do is predetermine or have a weighting factor of what you may do as renewals as a more urgency than doing it as a one-off project, and that's why I would like to see that in that criteria if possible. Um, and the only thing, and I totally understand why it hasn't been addressed, um, are the potential changes under the Local Government Act, um, for, or whatever the Local Government Minister may be deciding to do with waters. And we've heard a lot about wastewater and water. We haven't heard a lot about stormwater, and I'm just interested to understand, has this got any ramifications, or is it still a complete unknown as far as that work that the government's doing? I'd suggest it's still a relative unknown. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, in that case, with the, I, I, I'm happy to move as per the order paper and option one with that one amendment. Seconded. Thank you, Councillor. It was the ability... It's under C. Under C. Yeah. It's the addition of infrastructure... Oh, sorry, ab ability to incorporate into renewals programme. I'm oh, sorry, I did it while she's typing that one other question. The Code of Subdivision, will that need to be updated because of this and, and other work? Uh, the Code of Subdivision needs to be updated uh, anyway, yeah. um, but any policy change through this work will we'll need to flow through to that document as well. Thank you. Sorry. Thank, thank you. With that amendment, it's moved and seconded. Any discussion? I, don't, I think it's been self-explanatory. I don't need to talk to it as a mover. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Gary. This may feel like uh, somewhat of a Pandora's box, but I appreciated the report because it gave the long-term review where we'll be looking at a number of matters, and it gave that interim solution, um, which addresses some very stressful situations for some of our community. And I know from working with uh, some of the folk uh, on the peninsula, which I is a place where people are very aware of weather events and the effect on them and the flooding, and try to be really proactive about that. Um, I know that this has been, for many people who experience this, a very stressful situation. I appreciate the efforts of the staff to get to this point where we have criteria that are objective and can be worked through in a fair and just way, um, but also addresses, address the issues. Um, so I will be uh, supporting this motion. Any, uh, thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Thanks very much. I'll be supporting this motion too, obviously. Um, it's good to see we're having an interim response, but it's the long-term review that I'm going to be most interested in. I think we have a lot of assets out there that are not directly under our control, and we're going to have to get an integrated system in place to have good outcomes. So I, I really um, commend staff for bringing this forward, and um, I'm looking forward to the review as it comes out. Thank you. Councillor Vandervis. I can vote for this because it's a start, albeit much too late of a start and much too little of one. I find it quite disturbing that we've had confirmed today that even if we doubled or quadrupled the budget, not a lot more could get done because we don't have the appropriate staff despite having so many of them, to actually get contractors to dig holes and put pipes in where they're required. The days when the DCC used to do this kind of work and we used to employ a number of people that used to breastfeed shovels and occasionally dig a hole for whatever uh, are well gone. There are any number of contractors now out there that are quite capable of putting a pipe in anywhere you want one um, if you simply pay them to do it. The too hard basket of where to put pipes uh, and the expertise required to actually ensure that they are of appropriate size and will actually do the job, uh, again, that is something which we regularly call on consultants to uh, provide us the information for. And it seems extraordinary to me that this proof of long-term deferred maintenance in our drainage system uh, is set to continue. The point of order, Madam uh, Chair. 
Um, the paper is referring to the deteriorated state of private infrastructure. Um, I don't think it's fair to characterise that as our water assets, as Councillor Vandevers has. Um, that it, it is about private st um, stormwater and private laterals that it's this report about, and the council contributing or assisting with that process of upgrading. So it's not about public. I find it extraordinary that you would want to characterise this report that says public-private boundary on Three Waters Networks as simply private. But since that's how you want to call the shots, I don't then think I that have nothing further to say. That wasn't the point, thank you. And I'm sorry, it shouldn't have been given you a chance to respond. Thank you. Councillor O... Um, no. Sorry. Any other uh, comments? I will, uh, in my right of reply, I'd like to um, note that this is... Um, it, it's really good to see staff getting into position to, to do change as we now, with some confidence, go out to the community to talk about employing more staff so that we can actually do this work. Um, it seems to um, be that you're forward thinking and I am thrilled to see that. I'm also concerned that people make comments that contractors can do these jobs when it's very nature of some of the work that has been done by by contractors for private people that have got us now into the position because they do not understand the bigger picture, albeit that that was done totally with the um, acquiescence or um, delegation from council to do that. But sometimes a big picture view is needed to oversee this stuff to get the big, to get the best results. Um, but it's actually what we're talking about here is people understanding what they're responsible for, and it's not an easy um, game. Anyone who's God forbid, practice land law, um, knows that un understanding where those boundaries are and the expectations of the clients to what they are responsible to and then explaining what they may, itch, what all those small print on their certificate of title means, um, is, 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 is very, very difficult to explain and the nuance of it. Um, I'm thrilled that we're now addressing this. It's a, been a very long time discussing it at um, chairs level um, when we can have enough data to understand what we can do. Um, there's been some very sad stories about people very badly affected by some of this work having a huge impact on their places but not being able to control the water that's feeding into those drains um, and or to be able to control it. And the fact that the council's putting their hand up and saying we're going to create a policy that makes it fair for everyone to focus on solutions that work for everyone and it may come at cost to people but perhaps we will be the bank of first choice to provide for that in, in a rate system, we don't know, but at least we're going to have that discussion out there. And I think it's really important that when this stuff is being reported that we don't worry about the who's being employed and who's not what's being employed, but that we're actually concentrating on how a city works really well together and efficiently and effectively so that we all win rather than um, some people, as we've heard today in the public forum, having some really negative effects. So um, are we supporting this? And thank you to the staff for bringing the paper to us. And um, I know that's been a considerable amount of work um, in getting us to this point. Thank you. I'm now going to put the motion. All in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. The next report, um, we've now been going, oh, it's only an hour and a half, no, we'll keep on going. Yeah, no, so just checking. It's, it's not for us, it's for the staff, actually. Um, item six, three waters activity report for the two quarters ending the 31st of December, 2018. Mr. Dyer, you're here alone again. Would you like to speak to your report? No, straight to questions, please. Questions on item six. There are no, oh, Councillor Lord. I just noticed that the year to date, the rolling 12 month average, we're actually a wee bit lower on water breaks. Is that just a really, um, just a good year or is it just, uh, that's uh, page 33. Is that just, uh, just a matter of circumstance sort of thing? No reason for that? Uh, no, we've seen a steady downward track uh, over the last, um, over the last three years in water main breaks uh, and that's, typically reflective of, um, I think your microphone's on, uh, typically reflective of uh, a renewals program that's in place and targeting those failures. Um, uh, and, but you can also see a similar trend in our, um, uh, in our number of foul soil blockages as well. So the number of failures we're having there is, is trending down steadily. 
Yeah, and, and what, sorry, I didn't quite pick up what the implication, why is that happening? Because of targeted? Uh, targeted renewals, so we're renewing a lot more pipes than we ever have, have done in the past. Um, yep. uh, so I think uh, if you look back to 20, well, 2008, 2009, uh, our renewals budgets were in the order of uh, two or $300,000 for water main renewals. Um, now they're much more than 10 times that, so you're starting to see benefit um, uh, in terms of our failure rates. Our failure rates, uh, when compared with other places, are still reasonably high, um, uh, and so we still have a way to come down. Your earlier comment that over the next 30, I think you said 30 years, about 70% of our um, water network will have to be renewed, is that, um, is that something that you see as a, a major negative problem, or is that, um, that's not, how much of that is timing that would have to happen anyway versus uh, perhaps under investing in the past decades? Uh, it's a little bit of both. So um, uh, typically uh, the asset management approach of the, of the uh, distant past was to wait until something broke before uh, before replacing that. But if you, if you do that on a network level with 1,400 kilometres of, um, of water main, um, you find yourself, especially if you've installed a lot of that pipe work at the same time, you find yourself in a position um, where those failures right across your network start to increase to a level which is just unsustainable. Um, if you get to that point, um, uh, the the prospect of a heavy of a large renewals program does become um, a, a little bit of a burden. Whereas at the moment we're in a position where uh, we're intervening early enough to see our break rates trending down, um, uh, and we're in a position to keep driving those down and, and make some clever decisions around um, how we renew our infrastructure in the future, um, most efficient ways to deliver that, and um, uh, and making sure we get our policies and practices right to make sure that we benefit the community as much as possible. Thank you very much. Councillor Vanvis. I'm pleased to note that on the graph on page 33 that your number of water main breaks is trending down and is uh, below both previous years. Um, in terms of actually the asset management plan that you just spoke of, um, I was surprised when the bus hub delays were apparently caused by pipes not being in the position that was anticipated. And I'm wondering if your asset management plan accurately identifies condition and position of our underground water infrastructure. Uh, so some of our some of our asset records are um, uh, have a little bit of error in them. Um, in that particular case, the pipe was about three to six inches, I think, away from where it should have been, um, uh, or away, the pipe was three to six inches away from where the map said it was. Um, so the margin for error is very small when you're talking about a six-inch pipe. Um, however, um, when you uh, in the construction business, that sort of um, uh, that sort of error can make all the difference to a project. And um, uh, I'd suggest that our records are fit for purpose, but they're always something we're trying to improve as well to make sure that we're making good decisions before we start spending money on construction. Are the records in the CBD or in the older, more established parts of the city uh, any more questionable than, say, in the newer um, suburban uh, development areas? or are the newer um, pipe works much more accurately uh, p uh, positioned? Uh, it's hard to comment. Typically we don't um, uh, don't end up working on those, that newer infrastructure often, um, so therefore don't see um, the negative effects of a record being wrong, but we do have good strong controls in place in terms of uh, making sure that the records that our developers provide are, um, are fit for purpose. Um, there is a, a significant variance in the quality of records depending on the borough council. Um, uh, so uh, Green Island uh, Borough is one, one council that has typically quite poor records, whereas um, uh, St Kilda was very good. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. 
Thank you. Um, Tom, um, page 35, paragraphs 27, 28. Um, are those numbers typical? Are they high average or low in regards to quarter one two, and two, 2,362 plant planned maintenance orders? And uh, Those numbers are quite typical. We, 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 in our network plan maintenance work, we typically hit 100%. Um, uh, the, and the plant space, uh, we have an uh, internal um, maintenance team made up of um, uh, fitters and electricians, um, and they do, they do typically get through a good portion of their planned work. Uh, however, uh, you, depending on the month, you can have a number of different reactive failures that cause, um, cause a bit of a strain on resource, um, but they, they normally come very close, and we have had an improvement over the last six months in that space. So we're averaging about 300 um, work orders to city care per month. Uh, the actual number is quite a lot more than that. Um, so the, that's planned maintenance. Um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you exactly how many work orders we're issuing through city care a month. Okay. Um, the next question I have for you is uh, over the page, uh, paragraph 31, coastal erosion. You talk about the uh, quality of the. Um, Geotextile tubes at Sinclair, um, and with the upgrade or the monitoring program, the work done last year. Um, what does the end of the um, sand sausages look like? Is that um, pretty stable? Is it um, of any concern? Uh, it has. I'm actually not too sure about the end. I know that there's been um, some developments down there in recent times in terms of uh, erosion. We've had quite a number of significant uh, south swells. Um, uh, I'd probably defer to one of the locals. Um, <laughs> um, I know, I know that the end, the end wall effect that has been mooted there in the past hasn't hasn't come to fruition. Um, but we haven't had a, you know, there's plenty of storms that um, have come in the past that we haven't seen since the sausages were installed. Okay, and I guess the based on what we see here in item five, uh, on item six. And item five, I guess I go back to something you um, commented on earlier. Um, do we have enough staffing capabilities in-house and are we consulting work out that should be done in-house? Uh, it's always a fine balance between the level of resource that you bring in-house or, 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 um, or, or procure through consultants. Um, uh, a lot of the consult, like a lot of the consultancy work that we do get done, provides very good value, um, quick, fast, efficient um, uh, work with a decent um, uh, level of risk transfer in terms of um, who's responsible for the design and and all of that sort of stuff. Um, uh, but by the same token, we've got a really, really capable um, uh, uh, range of staff members within the Three Waters business unit that are, um, are all doing very good work at the moment. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just um, at the end of your report, you talk about the priorities for the next quarter and quarters. Um, in terms of the capital plan, um, can you confirm or assure us that the um, design and implementation of the capital plan in the retail quarter in this instance will ensure that there are no further delays in terms of the wider street works in that part of town? Are uh, you referring to the central city plan? So we, um, we've been working as a part of a team uh, led by Richard uh, and the transport group uh, to, to make sure that any, any infrastructural changes uh, that are required there won't slow the project down at all or, or will be accounted for. Um, but the bulk, of, the bulk of those assets will be, the assets that are in place in the retail quarter at the moment will be new assets once that project's done. Thank you. Any other questions? Happy to move the uh, noting that report. Seconded, Councillor Benson Pope. Any discussion? Thank you. Um, all in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, carried. Thank you for the thorough report. Number seven, Parks and Recreation Activity Report. Um, just in case it's still going at 3:10, I just apologies. I got an email late from or during the meeting from Councillor Steadman to say be an apology for leaving early. So apologies. That will need to be noted somewhere. Thank you. Who, would you like to speak to your report, Ms. West? 
No, I'm happy to take questions. Very good. Any questions? Councillor Gary? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr West, um, first of all, just for context, uh, the appreciation of the community <coughs> around the meeting on Labor Day at Tauroni. Are you happy with the progress being made on the Tauroni project? Yeah, I, um, I, I think it's been a good process and I think that was reflected in um, Paul's presentation to annual plan this year. Um, so we're happy with it as it stands at the moment. In item 29 on page 41, uh, the Broad Bay pontoon, which I have to say I only just saw the, re uh, the renewed platform recently, pontoon recently, and was impressed by the quality of that upgrade. I wanted to know um, how planning's going on for the Harbour Edge assets that we own. Um, do we have an overall plan for that in terms of maintenance? Because it has been neglected in the past times. Yeah, yeah. We've just embarked on that process, haven't we? No, un unlike uh, like many other um, projects in parks at the moment, we're still in a fairly reactive mode, um, looking at some of that asset management stuff. Um, I think what you'll see this year is a much more proactive strategic approach to a lot of things, in including the marine uh, infrastructure, which I might add our parks. Parks Officer Pete McGruth is doing a fantastic job, um, but um, we need to get into a much more strategic mindset with, with some of that. Thank you. And would you have any further comment about the volunteer programme and the um, effect that's having on um, particularly tracks and so forth and work around that? Any comment about that? Yeah, I, I just think we're really lucky with the staff member we've appointed into that role and the, 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 the linkages and the uh, work that it allows us to do across agency with DOC. Um, so that's a really big positive and that pays dividends and rolls into other projects we're doing. Um, and I think um, the number of volunteers we're seeing in that program, again, it, it, when we look at Parks and Rec um, and our strategy in engaging with the community and getting people involved, I think it, um, it pays dividends uh, and adds value. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Vandervis. I'm delighted that something we have done attracts the sentence has been very popular with very few issues arising. Um, the Freedom Camping, uh, the new site, that's been at Thomas Burn Street has obviously um, taken some pressure off some of the other places, although there's still pressure reported. Have you noted the number of informal freedom campers at the Kensington Hotel Ardmore Drive in their car park? And have you looked at perhaps formalising what is already quite established informal uh, arrangement there with the Kensington Hotel. Yeah, so we've started to collect data on, on that site, which you uh, might have noticed in the, the, the latest monthly report we've put together. So we'll be looking at the data um, moving forward now for that site. And, and I guess at the end of the season, when we review how it's gone this year, that'll be, that'll be part of the consideration for planning for next year. Is that something that's going to need to come back to council or if you find that it's uh, not got any real hooks in it, it's something you can just simply action yourselves? I, I, I haven't got a pick for that yet. I think okay. we'll just see how we go at the end of the season and we'll certainly want to have a conversation with the council about how this season's gone when we get to the end of it. Um, Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks, Mr West, for your quick response to the letter I sent you yesterday from the Long Beach resident talking about not just Freedom Camping, which I'd like to follow up on now, but also the issue of the signage and vehicles and so on, where I think your, your action and that of your staff has led to some significant progress, so well done. But mm. In terms of the Freedom Camping, though, um, and Long Beach apparently starting to be a an anecdotally um, advertised um, destination. Um, was that something that was on the radar or was that a surprise, that message yesterday? Uh, it was a bit of a surprise. Um, we, had, uh, we had a site visit down at Long Beach uh, in December, but that was around the Reserves and Beaches bylaw further to the public forum presentation, I think, in November to Council. 
Um, so the actual freedom camping issue at that site has been uh, a little bit of a surprise. We've had a concerns rate about drainage uh, in the recent past and also about litter management, but not freedom camping. So we'll certainly follow up on that now. Okay, and on the particular issue of the complaint about the two-day delay before anyone visited the, offend the offending tent campers. Yeah. Um, is that a satisfactory um, response to a complaint, or was that just aberrant or to do with so, the holiday season? So that, stuff that, that, that was on New Year's Day, and I haven't followed up on that complaint yet with CSA, but I will do so. Thank you. Um, but I can assure you that the complaints come in today. We all, we'll see Armour Guard and our rangers on site there. Um, that's what I've asked for, so that we can look at what's happening there. Thank you. Councillor Steadman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Weasel, I'm just wondering, uh, again, freedom camping, I'm sorry. Uh, are you aware of the pressure that's going on in the St. Clair area? Um, there was a lot of camping vans down there. I've got photos. Um, uh, they're even up on blocks to level them out and stuff like that. Um, so are you aware of the situation down there? So again, there was an email um, with some concerns last uh, Tuesday. Yes, thank you, uh, from Councillor Wiley. And I, I'm not sure... I, I'm not sure whether that's a, the, uh, the report is, is that we are getting some freedom camping on that site, which is allowed under the bylaw as long as it's self-contained vehicles. Um, I think we had a large number on that night, and I'm still not sure whether it was linked to the uh, Chinese New Year, and we saw the temporary closure of Thomas Burns on that same evening um, for a 24-hour period because the fireworks were being set off from that site. So I don't know whether it was spill out. Uh, or whether it's um, an ongoing issue. But we can, we've certainly um, got on the guard looking at it, so um, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Yeah, the only reason I, uh, I I've, these photos are actually only from a couple of days ago, actually, just okay. more recently. Right. Um, and there's a vehicle right in the corner, as I said, on levelling blocks, um, obviously set in, because obviously with, uh, there's probably a lot of surface and stuff with the nice weather and the, yep. yeah, the hotter weather. So I'd, I'd encourage you to send stuff through to us because we do follow up on it um, um, and we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Councillor Elder. Thank you, Kate. Um, thank you, Rob, for all your work you've done on, on that freedom camping. And that, that's the question I'm going to ask is, um, what's the feedback from uh, Warrington and Ocean View in particular about um, all of the changes you've put in place? Well, uh, again, if I refer back to the presentations at annual plan, um, I think I heard um, Alistair from Warrington complimenting us on the way we've managed that this year and the numbers have reduced by about 35%, I think was the mm. figure quoted. Um, and um, Scott also is, is, is happy, I think, with the management of um, the Ocean View and the Brighton Domain, and that's, that's in relation to some of the infrastructure that we've been able to put in place around litter management and toilets this year, and also the rangers. Um, we are, um, like with the St. Clair issue that's just been raised, and uh, Long Beach, um, Scott has been in touch with me around some of the traffic down on the uh, Brighton Road, uh, which again we'll follow up on now, it's been raised with us. So the feedback on the um, introduction of ranges? Uh, it's pretty positive, um, and it's certainly something that we I, will be looking at when we review the season, and I think... Um, What's, what's working really well is it's, it's um, again, it's that, it's that linkage and cross-organisation cross working with DOC. It's helping us build a much better relationship with DOC. So um, uh, it's, it's helping on a number of fronts. Yeah, thanks for all your hard work. Councillor O'Malley. I'm just going to try to avoid um, any Freedom Camping questions. Um, tourism Infrastructure Fund, are we going to put anything in this year to help support um, any of those activities? Yes, we are um, working on a bit at the moment. Um, the timeline, we've been in touch with MB um, to notify them of what we're doing and we're starting to talk with them. Um, we are working with transport and with uh, economic development to get that bid ready for, I think the deadline is 28 March. And uh, can I just understand on that, that will be in response to experience in the last few 
months and years on the demand that's needed for tourism infrastructure. From, I mean, it's going to be, but it's not just a whim, oh, we've got a pot of money, we're going for it, no, we're no. actually going to be responding yes. to concerns. So we've, we've, um, we've been talking about a number of potential bids um, uh, over the last few months. And it's really clear we had one of our staff go down to the MB presentation in Invercargill to get a really un good understanding of the um, criteria so that we're actually on the, on the button because we don't want to submit something that isn't going to be considered. So it's uh, the, the bid we're looking at is, is purely where we've got significant growth and infrastructure strains uh, in the city. Thank you. Any further questions? Oh, sorry, Councillor Elder. Um, just a quick question about the Tourism Infrastructure Fund, and that is, say, should a community um, have identified that their area is under strain, is there a possibility of them working with you on putting a bid in? Uh, in other words, can private people or um, private-public partnerships be happen in that space? That's, I, th I, think, um, I think the criteria, if we look at partnerships and the, and the bid we're looking to put in, whilst DOC won't be a formal partner, they will certainly be supporting our bid. Um, uh, it, it is as a positive when, when we apply for these things. So, uh, and we're asked as part of our criteria to demonstrate public and community support for any bid that we put in. So the answer is yes. Um, I guess we're still early days looking at how as an organisation we coordinate some of those bids. Um, to make sure we get um, the best applications forward. Councillor Gary. Just on that same theme, Mr West, um, and it might have been before your time, and Ms Graham might be able to answer this, but previously I'm aware that for previous bids to this kind of fund, we, Dunedin hasn't fit the criteria, but that may have changed. Our situation's changed, and Dunedin's changed in that time, so you're confident there will be, uh, it will, we will meet the criteria in different ways. Um, from the discussions we're having with MB and understanding the criteria, yes. I mean, you, you can't guarantee you're no. going to be successful. Um, the other thing we have clarified is if the bid is unsuccessful, whether we can resubmit it for the August round with amendments, and yes, we can do that. So I guess we will learn as we go sure. through. Thank you for clarifying yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you. There are no further questions. I'm happy to move the motion. Any seconders? Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Any, uh, that's to note the report, any discussion? Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, briefly, thanks to and thanks from uh, a community um, relevant to this report. Uh, I th think it's worth commending at this forum the work of the Greater Green Island uh, mm -hmm. Community Network for uh, facilitating the development of a playground facility in their community um, at a time uh, where council hasn't um, prioritised investment and increased levels of service uh, in that area and it's, it's a shame that they've had to resort to that but I, I do commend them for the, the work that they've done uh, in making that happen and, and secondly uh, thank you from in a more parochial sense uh, thank you on behalf of the community in Port Chalmers. I'm fortunate enough to sit on the West Harbour Community Board with a couple of people whose public service extends uh, from the um, days of amalgamation, and they assure me that this is a campaign that has been waged since then. And Ms Lapham is probably better, um, better <laughs> able to attest to the um, veracity of those claims or not, but uh, it's certainly something that has occupied um, a great deal of uh, community concern for a great deal of time. So thank you, Mr West, for doing what had been written off as the impossible uh, by many in the Port Chalmers community by making that um, project uh, come to fruition. And I do wish the residents of Fairfield well um, with our, uh, our well-loved uh, public toilet from Port Chalmers. I, I miss its uh, melodious tune uh, as I wander down the main street and, and I, wish, uh, uh, I wish them uh, all the best for that fine facility and its new life. I'm Thank sure you. they'll welcome you out there to hear it there. <laughs> um, Councillor Gary. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to add my thanks uh, from those who appreciate the Harbour Edge facilities, members of the community who live on that Harbour Edge, to see that work being done uh, and the member of the team uh, who has real skills in that area is uh, a, real, a real positive for many people in the community. Um, but I note that we haven't drawn attention to uh, congratulating Botanic Garden Collections Supervisor Barbara Wheeler, uh, who was named as one of the six successful applicants in the report. It mentions that I just want to draw attention to that. 
uh, because it's always wonderful to see staff acknowledged in that way. Any other statements? I'll put the motion all in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Thank you very much. You got that off very easily. Ms Graham, are you staying here for more? Okay. Uh, property services activity report for the two quarters ending the 31st of December. We're going to do this item and then I'm going to suggest we do a break for, it will be over two hours and I think it's only fair for staff to have a break. So we'll just hopefully get through this one quite quickly. I, we may or may not. Would you like to introduce your report, Ms Bainbridge, or are you happy to just speak to it? Oh, to, to take questions, yeah. Any questions of Mr Bainbridge? Councillor Lord? Yeah, how are you? Thank you for coming along today. Um, I just had a question. I wanted to just double check some figures on the value of the social housing portfolio. Um, just I was thinking we had a value of about $91 million of those properties. Could you t refer to a paragraph? Sorry. No, uh, oh. I haven't got a paragraph. I'm asking oh, a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if you've got the value of the social housing properties. Social housing, the community housing portfolio was valued in June last year at 75 million. At 75, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Elder? Uh, just a question. Um, I note that um, we are not, not buying consultants as much and I note that you're putting your staff through training. I was just wondering, um, like what the feedback is on that from, from your staff? Yeah, it's been really positive. Obviously, the staff respond well to development and being invested in as, as individuals. Um, and it creates a better kind of team morale, better culture when they're all invested in the long term rather than being kind of fixed term appointments or, or short term roles. They're all permanent employees, all, all invested for the long haul. It's been really positive. Um, and um, is there any sort of plans for sort of long-term training um, coming up or? Uh, we're still developing a kind of skills matrix that we'll, that we'll need and looking at what, what that would look like. Thank you. Councillor Vandervis. On page 49, we've got a, um, uh, a situation where 91% of respondents to the um, survey were happy in the first quarter, but only 85% in the second. Do you have a particular reason for that or any understanding of, of why there might be that bit of a drop? No, that kind of variation is, is to be expected, although we've said here in, in paragraph 12 and paragraph 13, it's around about 250 tenants that are surveyed, they don't all respond, so the response Certainly. rate's not that great, so the statistical variation's reasonable. Right, and th there wasn't uh, any particular change in, in the way you managed them or in, in, or in uh, rental rates or anything like that no, during the time? No. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Mr Bainbridge. Two questions, one on page 47, 2B, around the training on removing tenancy barriers for people with mental health issues. Um, is there quite a lot of work to do on that or do we, do we sort of stack up pretty well currently? Or is that an ongoing work in progress? It's important to remember that we're not a social services provider. We don't employ healthcare professionals. Um, that being said, the type of tenants we have have unique challenges. So our staff do very well and, and have got very good links with local agencies and other service providers. Um, but it's about helping our staff get better at recognising those challenges. And my second question was page 56, 51, one, uh, I, next steps. Peninsula Cycleway continuing land acquisitions for the completion of the Peninsula Cycleway connection. How extensive is that acquisition requirement? Um, it's lot, lots of little tiny bits. Um, so yeah, quite, quite a bit of work involved there with, uh, with our team and then some external people there we're working with. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr Bainbridge. Um, just um, a question around paragraphs 11, 12, 13. It's around community housing tenant satisfaction rates. Um, and the, the shift there in terms of the, the percentage of tenants who feel like their um, residence meets their needs, is that as much 
Um, is that as much about their needs changing during their tenancy as it is around the um, deterioration or appropriateness or otherwise of the accommodation they're in? No, I don't think so. I think, um, as, as I said to Councillor van der Vis, um, that variation that you're seeing is, is to be expected. Where, where the tenants um, don't tick the box for either ex uh, meets needs or exceeds needs, it, it tends to be a, a case that perhaps they have unrealistic expectations in terms of the size of the unit or parking availability or that kind of thing. It's not so much a change in the unit, it's, a, it's what they expect from it. Any other questions? I'm happy to move the noting of the report and thank you, Mr. Bainbridge. Seconded, Councillor O'Malley. Any discussion? All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to move that we have a uh, 10 minute recess for those that need to have a quick break. Seconded, Councillor Benson Pope. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against. You may leave the table. Nine, the Waste and Environmental Solutions Activity Report for the two quarters ending the 31st of December 2018. Councillor Ms. Graham. Shh. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Henderson, would you like to speak to your report? Uh, not particularly, although I would just like to mention that the, um, uh, the reports that were attached were obviously finalised at the end of last year and the work has been going, ongoing, so some of the dates and stuff that are in those reports. On the waste futures. The, yep, in the attachments there. They might, um, they're probably slightly out of date now, but nothing significant. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins is waving his hand at me. What would you like to ask? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Wilson. Um, I've got a couple of questions just around the waste futures uh, work. Um, there's been some commentary over the weekend around um, the potential budgets associated to some of the options, um, figures as high as a million dollars being quoted for a potential replacement landfill. Are you aware of... 100 million? Uh, 100 million. Yeah. Are you aware of the evidential basis for such a figure? Uh, not particularly that, if you're just talking a landfill, that would be a uh, particularly fancy landfill. Um, that budget figures that I would estimate would be um, considerably less than that, less than 50% of that for actually establishing a landfill. Uh, but however that figure may be coming from, if you're talking about a whole system, waste disposal system, including collection contracts and other infrastructure, it could possibly get up into that sort of region. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. And, and secondly, there's been a comment made around the uh, age and therefore appropriateness of some of the information around the Smooth Hill site um, and, and the suggestion made that that work needs to be redone uh, to feed into that process. Do you have any comment to make about that? Yeah, that work has been redone and uh, will be redone this year. Uh, so that's the detailed business case and one of the um, ongoing work streams that we're into now is actually doing <coughs> the full geotech analysis etc for the Smooth Hill site to ensure that there is actually no um, fatal flaws with that site. So that, that work was always going to be done as a matter of course as this work progressed? Yeah, it had to be. The original data we've got is back from the early 90s so we had to do it again to actually make sure it would meet modern standards. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm happy to move the report in due course. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Vandervis. Um, regarding plastic recycling, we're still collecting numbers one to seven, but I understand only have a market for, or had only a market for one and two. What are we doing with uh, plastics three to seven? And is there a potential market um, in sight for those? Uh, so we do actually have markets for all the all the plastics. One and two, we do have markets in New Zealand. Uh, all the other plastics are exported overseas via our third party contractor, uh, OI, uh, OJI, sorry. Uh, so they're currently going to um, the likes of, um, at last count, the last time I saw a report, it was Malaysia and Indonesia, those countries, et cetera, for recycling. So is there a cost or an additional cost to us having to send this stuff overseas? Uh, not at this present point in time. The contract that we have with Enviro Waste, when there was money in recycling, we used to receive a rebate, which came off the costs of the contract. Uh, obviously, we have not received a rebate in um, quite some time. 
Uh, at the moment, in fact, our contractor is, uh, they're losing money on the recycling. Right, um, are, are we discussing this report at the moment, the uh, open attachments, or are we just looking at what's it's in the... It's all part of item nine, I think. Just item nine? Right, I think they're all part of item they nine. They are all a part of it, okay. Um, the, the fact that the amount of uh, waste that we <coughs> have direct control of is, is less than 20%, I believe 19%, going to the landfill. And the fact also that if we look at your pie graph um, in terms of CO2 emissions, um, uh, waste is 7.4%. Um, if you take 19% of 7.4%, you only end up with just over 1% in terms of an issue that we actually have some control over regarding CO2 emissions. Do you think that the money we're spending trying to pursue that 1%, and I'm talking about all the reports and all the strategies that we're undertaking, do you think that it's actually a good use of ratepayers' money to be putting so much effort into reducing CO2 emissions that are in fact only about 1% of what Dunedin produces? Um, so. I'm not sure which one you're referring to, but I believe when you're talking about the 7.4%, that's actually of council's emissions. Yes. And because council owns the landfill, that's actually all the emissions, whether it's whether we put it, the waste there or not. So it's not 7.4 um, of 19, that is 7.4% of Dunedin's waste uh, emissions. Yes, but, but we only control 19% of that. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that... The, the only real lever that we have uh, for reducing CO2 is effectively 19% of 7.4%, which is about 1% of what Dunedin produces. My question was, is the effort that we're putting in and the costs associated with what we're doing to try and minimise that, do you really see that that's justifiable given the very small lever that we have to do anything with? Um, that would be probably be up to personal opinion in the simple fact that if we go with a system where council gets more involved in the waste stream and actually has, has a greater impact and has more control over the carbon emissions, um, it's basically down to council policy around how we want to achieve our carbon net zero goals. And okay. if we want to actually have that enough impact to be able to achieve those. Right. There's statements in the report which suggest that we could extend the existing landfall southwards uh, and uh, have it within current height limits uh, up to 2028, which would give us a little more time to establish alternatives, whether they be Smooth Hill or otherwise. Is this assuming the current contour angles uh, that is to say the steepness of the slopes, is there any option of actually increasing the steepness of slope and still staying under your height limit requirements? Uh, in some areas it is like it, we are able to change the um, angle of the slope at the, the size of the better. It's also part of the piece of work we're doing around um, maximising the space that we sort of have available at Green Island is at the moment because it's not actually a dug hole, it's actually built up. So we're building buns at the side of it as we go. Right. Um, those buns at the moment are built of clean fill. Um, so we're looking at the moment of, about what sort of angle of batter was safe if we actually build right to the edge with waste and then just put a cap over the side of it. So that, that would be one way of extending um, the actual footprint within the existing consent. Right. Now, when they talk about extending the consent out to 2028 in this report, are they assuming that your current uh, steepness of, of uh, Bund is going to be maintained? Uh, yeah, it's based on the, the... In there, when you're talking the extra space, it's mm. based just a calculation based on how much air space that would give us on, under the existing operational parameters. Right, but um, noting that in some places the uh, Bunds are much steeper than in other places, mm. when you look at the contour lines, there is then possibly the potential to actually steepen 
other areas and actually increase the space over and above what's suggested in this report? Potentially, um, that's some of the options that we, we need to investigate further, is how actual safe that is. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, two questions. The first of them relates to the question that Councillor Hawkins asked about the <coughs> geotech work on Smooth Hill. At the time of the original choice and investigation, um, presumably some of that work was done. Um, is that not of a standard that is any longer satisfactory, or does it just have to be renewed because of the fact it's age? A uh, combination of both, actually. It, it is old, so it would need to be renewed, and it was done for the standards that existed at the, at the time, standards so it's, it's the not time. comprehensive enough to meet current standards. So it was done perfectly well at the time, but times have moved on, and, and the, um, parameter, the conditions around consent requirements are now tougher than they were. Thank you. The second one is about your comment about trucking material out of the need and it featured on the front page of the ODT last week. Last week? Last week. Um, you talked about that as not a very palatable option and I wanted to um, congratulate you on that understatement. Um, I, do you recall the workshop where we discussed, one of the workshops where we discussed these issues at the strong view of elected members about the fact that such a solution was more than not very unpalatable but highly unpalatable and potentially very offensive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but it, we need to keep it on the table in case we have no other option. Um, we can do everything we can to try and address the problems that we have at the moment, um, but if we may end up running out of um, landfall space with no other option I acknowledge, I acknowledge there's been no vote on that issue that I'm aware of, but um, it seems to me perhaps we need to have one at some point because it seems to me that uh, for a lot of elected members that is not an acceptable solution under any circumstances. Mm. And I'll look, I'll look after seeing that that decision is reached or not. Uh, uh, Worship the Mayor. Um, Chris, I, I, I share um, Councillor Van der Vis's concern about um, the, the proportion of waste that we control as a council. So I just want to clarify again the relevance of that 7.4 per cent. Is that the emissions, is it 7.4, is 7 the, the waste emissions, is that across the whole city or is that the proportion of all waste disposed of in the city or just the waste at our landfill? Your Not, Worship, would you mind referring to the page so that everyone can... Yeah, page 15 of 170 in the um, Phoenix. open attachments. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, so that is the council mission. So that, that is our basically just green iron and landfill. So that's that is not um, the proportion. That's not the total waste from Dunedin that's disposed of. Uh, no, it's not. However, the other waste that's disposed of, apart from the green fill out in Burnside, um, National Ross is the only. Uh, Burnside is the only other landfill, they're not allowed to take protrusible, protrusible waste. Um, so they, they do have timber out there which would be producing CO2 emissions. Um, that's not included in those titles. Right, right. So in actual fact there's more carbon, um, there's a bigger carbon footprint than just this uh, amount here. Yeah. Uh, right. And yeah. so the follow-up question is, if more landfills had to comply with the standards that Dunedin, land, Green Island landfill had to comply with, we would presumably have more control over a greater proportion of the waste in the city and be able to have more impact on our carbon emissions. Yes, correct. Yeah. Uh, obviously, as, as you're aware, the uh, emissions trading scheme doesn't apply to anything apart from a class one landfill, and Green Island is the only class one landfill. Right. So, were uh, regulations put in place either by central government or the authority of the, uh, the ORC uh, that um, required compliance with those standards to a greater extent, then we, the Dean City Council would have a better chance of uh, achieving you know, a, 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 a significant reduction in carbon? Yes, correct. Yes, Thank you. Cheers. Uh, Councillor Elder. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, Chris, thank you for this report. Um, I was just um, a question, really. Um, I know that the West Coast are looking at um, uh, putting in a, a boiler, basically a big, huge furnace, to burn things up. And I know in Europe, um, there's a lot of places that are now using it. So it produces energy, it burns things to a cinder, and there's not much left over, which can be then put in the tip. Are we looking at some of those options where we can recover as much as possible, but then burn some? Uh, at this point, and you'll see in the program business case report, um, waste to energy was one of the options that was evaluated, and it made it basically through the first round of evaluation and not any further uh, because it didn't meet all our, the multi criteria analysis. So, incineration has been discounted as an option at this point. Okay. Um, because also, some of that carbon can be captured in, say, having glass houses and using it for growing. Yeah. yeah, so the, um, it is quite widely used in Europe, um, but only if you can cap produce electricity and capture the heat for second reuse. However, on the opposite side of the coin, in the United States, quite a few incinerators are in the process of being shut down. Uh, okay. So it sort of yeah, depends on which area you look at as to which, how successful they are. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I think I should have declared that there was an interest uh, and that my, um, Councillor O'Malley and I both sat on as per delegations on that uh, working group on business case and scenario um, case. Councillor O'Malley. Thanks, Chris. Um, I just got a few questions around the report. Um, item nine. Uh, oh, sorry, no, number thirteen. The, um, you're talking about um, higher standards required for recycling in your main report. Let's go back over to that now because I'm looking at the other one. Um, yeah, page 60, item number 13, increasing contamination is largely due to the MRF applying higher standards during recycling. Um, do you see this getting any better? Do you see the standards ever dropping again, or is this going to keep rising? Uh, there's certainly no indications that the standards are going to get loosened up at all. In fact, I can only, at the moment, it only looks like the standards will get tougher. So would it be reasonable to say then in the very long-term trajectory we're looking here that probably exporting of recycling materials is going to start to become almost impossible to meet the standards, or at least very difficult to meet the standards? Yeah, I believe it's going to become very difficult, yes. And so as we're going forward, so this is my second question, what's the DCC going to do about establishing local markets? Um, Will that be part of work stream number one that's mentioned below when we talk about the development of the circular economy, or is that going to be done, say, a little bit further into the future? Uh, probably a little bit further in the future. We need to, it's sort of that two phase, we need to make sure we've actually got the materials, but um, uh, I would like to think we'd be able to bring in a staged approach as in uh, working with fragments, like if we decided to pick off plastics for a start, say three to seven, as mentioned by Council Vandalist before. Um, if we decided to try and figure out some solutions for that, and then once we had that working, we could move into something else, maybe timber. Um, yeah, it would have to be a staged approach. You can't fix everything all at once. No. Okay, so, so that's point 23, phase two of the project. So effectively, the work streams one through four are there, are really around establishment of new contracts for potentially a curbside, whatever we're going to do at curbside. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, establishing another landfill as it relates to eventually the termination of what goes on in Green Island mm -hmm. and whatever happens in between. Yeah. Um, we need to have more flexible contracts so that we can actually change it as things go. Yep. Okay, but there's not much in that work stream addressing the circular economy at the moment, so that will be the secondary activity once this one's knocked off? Uh, well, it, it's part of that as in actually developing what the um, detail one is. Yeah, yeah what, what, it it look actually, like. what it looks like. What does it mean in practice? Um, okay. So it is trying to establish that, although we're working to a fairly tight time frame. So, so we are working to a tight time frame, but I'm not going back there again today. <laughs> um, so effectively, then the outcome of Workstream 1 will be a description of what we see our challenges are, then there'll be a Workstream that will follow that afterwards. Yep, then we'll cool. get more work, yep. Cool. Um, then I go into number 49. Um, waste minimisation <coughs> small grants, they appear to be $500 per application. Mm -hmm. So they're quite small grants then, aren't they? Yeah, they are. So those, we've got the medium and large grants uh, uh, underway now. The small ones are more designed for, um, like if a school wants to 
um, build a worm farm, that sort of thing. Excellent, and, and that is next to 50. So how big will those new grants be? When uh, the largest out? one for industry, off the top of my head, $40,000. 40? ,000. Yeah. We've got $90,000 all up um, allocated to waste minimisation grants. Okay, so they can be a reasonable size then out of that 40,000 pool. Yeah. Okay, and just the capital projects, and as you said, these are old numbers, and I, I do believe that, in fact, the numbers are looking better as time goes on during the year. I'm looking at the Green Island landfill improvements, um, the Waikawaiti transfer station, and the Green Island landfill renewals are all at 21 to 36% spent, mm -hmm. so effectively not that far down their um, paths. Right. Are we right. catching up on that? Yeah, we are. We've, um, uh, my landfill engineer has uh, now handed over a bit over 20 um, fully scoped pieces of work to um, Okta to deliver for us. Uh, and that includes a major piece out at Green Island which is actually moving the approach road, etc. cetera, um, and a piece of work in March for another seven gas wells going in. Um, so yeah, um, we're looking to catch up quite quickly on a lot of that spend. Excellent, thanks. And now I'm just gonna quickly jump over to the other document and just ask a general question. When we talk about the percentage of waste that the council controls, and it's quite a small number, right? That doesn't reflect though everything that goes into Green Island, right? I mean, that reflects what yeah. we put into Green Island. Yeah, yeah, so that's basically what we have direct control over. So other stuff that comes to Green Island comes via uh, private or commercial. That 19% is basically what's generated from council activities. But, but if we were to control the facility like we do at Green Island, yeah. then while we don't have control of its delivery to the facility, we then have control of what happens once it arrives at the facility. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Because that would be important in designing going forward as we look at material recoveries or anything else. So I think I just wanted to clarify again to make sure everybody on the table understands that number that we talk mm. about that's quite small is just what we're collecting and taking to the facility. Yes. Then yeah. there's another quite big number that comes into the facility from other people, but we yeah. control the facility. Good, thanks. Great, thank you. Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, Chris, um, I feel like we're bouncing around here on a lot of different issues, but um, paragraph 17 on page 61, uh, construction demolition, demolition waste seminar event planning for January 2019. So that's obviously taken place. Yes, it did, yes. How did that go and what was the feedback? Uh, it went really very well, actually. We had a couple of um, speakers come in from out of town to actually talk to people. We've got quite a lot of interest in it being generated. Uh, we're hoping we can actually capitalise on that and form a, uh, another group, basically, to actually sit down with some, um, like Naylor Love and some of the big players in the industry and say, right, so what sort of infrastructure do you think we can help uh, as we go forward with Waste Futures, what do you guys really need? What would you like to see? What would you like to see council supporting with? And that may be you know, <coughs> uh, building infrastructure or, at, or actually just changing our consenting rules so that there is separation on a building site so that stuff can go to existing facilities without just being generally dumped. And that, uh, so a range of options in there and we want to get the industry to uh, engaged in telling us what they really want to see. Okay. Um, paragraph 31, uh, City Cardboard Collection. Can you just elaborate on the changes that were made? You know, uh, like a, additional uh, collection points, of, like with a three or four added, um, you know, a business is happier now with that change? Um, yeah, well, the, the ones in those affected area are happier. One of the, uh, the biggest complaints we normally review about, we get about those services, um, is especially coming up to Christmas, is there isn't enough um, supply. You know, there's, their demand exceeds what we can supply. Um, so with the additional, um, I think we ended up with four additional bins in place. So that's obviously getting agreements so that we can put in, in, the, in, the, in the extra additional bins and then get businesses signed up to use those ones. Um, that provided the extra capacity and uh, made it much easier for the contractor as well who was trying to collect just because of the sheer volume. And as you, you would have seen at times, especially up to Christmas, the amount of volume of cardboard in some of those location points can get a bit silly at times. Um, so now we're able to add some more servicing facilities. Um, okay, and then is there a, a, a quite a lag time between when uh, businesses put out their cardboard and then when it's picked up? Uh, no, the collection occurs um, on certain, well, there shouldn't be, 
uh, because the business are told quite clearly when the collections are taking place, a regular uh, date and time every, every week. Thank you. Um, one final question, paragraph 52. Um, you talked about uh, to assist with delivery of the capital projects, external project management assistance hmm. has been engaged with Okta Associates providing support for internal staff, um, enable eight major projects. Um, do we have a list of those eight major projects or is there a, can you quickly just summarise a couple of uh, the key ones? I don't have a, a full list with me, but so basically for that we're talking about the um, uh, Wakawiti capping and redevelopment of the Wakawiti, old Wakawiti landfill, uh, there's new approach road um, for Green Island, so basically moving the whole approach road with it, uh, over to the tip face has actually been moved over to the side. Um, there's drainage and paving improvements for the Green Island um, public area, uh, re-roofing and reinstalling the bird wire on top of the rummage store out there. Um, there's a couple more safety improvements to the transfer station um, and I'm forgetting something as well. Okay. Uh, but yeah, yeah, so the, the, we have a, a number of, and those are, the, those are the major ones. There's a lot of small things which are basically just signage and all that kind of stuff as well. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Henderson. I've got a couple of questions, um, uh, both following up from Councillor O'Malley. One about MIRF. Um, the, while you said it'll be harder, to, the, the quality of what is expected is getting higher. Is that necessary for every product? I imagine glass, for example, and cans. Um, mm. Is or s some items are easier to wash or to clean in the mm -hmm. processing thereof, th or to get rid of contamination than others. And yeah. um, so, I'm just in response. You said yes, the standards will continue to get <coughs> be, be tougher. But I'm thinking that that depends on the product, or yeah, not. Yeah, it does. So, for argument's sake, we are quite lucky and the reason we're still, one of the main reasons we're still finding markets for our recycling is because we don't put glass in the recycling mm. bin. Yeah. Um, smash glass, of course, the glass is no use and it contaminates everything else. Um, it's more along the lines of our bin inspection program that we're doing as well, just trying to educate people that um, you're putting cans and everything else in there is fine, but please clean it. Yeah. Um, because it's only, the, limit, the limitation on contamination for some of that stuff is 0.5%, so it doesn't take much before a load will be rejected. Um, so you had pizza boxes that are still covered in pizza. I mean, the cardboard's fine, but the pizza's not, you know, that, that sort of stuff. Yep, okay. Um, and the other one is um, in relation to the work streams going forward. Um, and the importance of understanding what the waste streams will be. Now, we have already seen a major government initiative preempted by the businesses themselves on plastic bags, but mm -hmm. the, um, my understanding of the process is, is weighing up what was likely to be the way in the waste streams, not to invest in something that may not be there in the future. And understanding, has, is there any clear direction yet been given by this government on product stewardship and waste, um, and, and because that will have a major effect on what those circular pro, um, how the circular economy will work? Uh, the government has identified its priority waste streams for stewardship initiatives. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head what those four are, but it's around... Batteries um, and tyres. Batteries, yeah. tyres, yeah. chemicals and something else. Um, I think, once again, industry appears to be leading the way. Some mm. of the big international players have now committed to having recyclable packaging by yeah. 2025. Some of the big players have also said they're going to go back to stainless steel and glass containers rather than plastic. Um, so... Yeah, well, I don't have any good indication from central government uh, about what... We know that they're going to play with the ETS and the waste levy, extend those. Apart from that, nothing firm. But from business, you're getting some fairly good um, ideas that things are changing? Yeah, it seems to be businesses are reacting to public opinion uh, a lot quicker than governments are, yes. OK, thank you. Um, I've got an indication that you'd like to move the motion. Councillor Hawkins, do you wish to speak to it? Oh, do you, what, which I'm, just move, I'm just going to move the recommendation. Move the recommendation. Is seconded. Thank you, Councillor Hall. Do you wish to speak to it? Yeah, I do. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Mr Henderson and his team uh, and the team of contractors and the small army of advisors from uh, various sectors who have fed into this work. Um, it is incredibly important work. Um, 
but I, I do want to I do want to touch briefly on um, what has attracted a lot of media and community interest uh, over the time since this agenda was made public, and that's around the uh, proposal to or the option of exporting our waste as a, as a long-term solution. Um, one of the three suggestions in the final paper of the three uh, is the closure of the Green Island landfill and the exporting of our waste uh, to parts unknown um, or a combination of parts unknown uh, in the long term, uh, which personally I find um, uh, difficult um, morally uh, and, uh, and culturally and environmentally and economically. Um, and I think what we've witnessed over the past few years um, at council is a growing tenor from within our community for this council to take a more active role in terms of um, our you know, guardianship and stewardship of our natural environment. And I find it hard to see how uh, we're gonna pursue any objective around leadership um, and give effect to that by uh, making our rubbish someone else's problem by um, sending it out of town, and I think it's a bit cute actually to have an assessment methodology where that ranks very highly for CO2 reduction um, because it just moves it onto someone else's balance sheet. Um, it's, uh, it's not really a, a, a palatable option, and I can't see the public appetite uh, for that. I appreciate that um, taking those sorts of options off the table does make the timeframes tight for finding a, a workable medium term and long term. Uh, solution, and I, I, I also wish that we had started this work sooner, uh, but I don't see the, the value at this point in looking backwards and uh, trying to apportion blame for that. I think the silver lining uh, of the fact that we've come to this work as late as we have is that the, uh, the, the climate that supports us being more ambitious around this work is far more uh, receptive than it would have been five years or ten years ago. And I mean that um, not just in the central government context, but also within this uh, organisation and, and with the, um, the added growing mandate from our community to be more ambitious around that. Um, and, and we're seeing that reflected in the feedback around <coughs> the, you know, the, the satisfaction levels around the residents' opinion survey are that we're not, you know, we're not doing enough and we hear every year people turning up saying we need to be doing more with our curbside collection. When, uh, when will that happen? And it gets pushed back further and further and I think that's, uh, that's something that can give us, uh, give us heart. Um, the focus obviously has been around that question about exporting waste, and I think that's a shame because uh, a lot of the a lot of the options that are being presented here for further development are genuinely uh, exciting, um, particularly around the idea of uh, developing a network of neighbourhood scale uh, resource recovery facilities, um, which have proven to be extremely effective in, in many communities uh, as a way of diverting waste and, and reducing waste that gets sent to the landfill uh, in the first place. Um, but I do want to note a, a, a caution, I suppose, around that and that uh, the success or otherwise of, of a system like that depends on the capacity within those neighbourhoods to be able to support often an, on a voluntary basis uh, that kind of work. Um, and when we get to the more detailed level, I think we need to think about how we might need to resource those differently in different areas to make sure that they have the best chance of, uh, of succeeding. Um, so that's the, that's the main uh, the main issue we've got, of course, dealing with our own, uh, dealing with our own rubbish. Uh, but it has been mentioned, uh, as has been pointed out, we need to deal with that wider context as well. I mean, it's very difficult for us uh, to make meaningful, make a meaningful difference to the waste stream when um, the waste levy <coughs> and the emissions trading scheme are so unevenly applied across the sector. We operate in an incredibly distorted market, um, and you know, and, and whether or not. The market is the mechanism for fixing your waste stream or not is, uh, is a philosophical debate for another day. But if you do believe that that is the mechanism that we should be applying, then at least give us the opportunity to, uh, to deal with it on the same terms as, as the private sector currently do. And we need uh, a greater steer from central government uh, around product stewardship. I mean, it's good that they're making some, we're making some progress in that regard, but the, the polluter pr pays principle suggests that you know, those who are manufacturing and distributing need to take a more active role in uh, the whole of life uh, cycle. And um, I don't want to relitigate the argument around the Regional Council's regional plan for waste, but a review of that would not be unhelpful uh, in terms of um, that kind of wider strategic piece around the region beyond the territorial limits uh, that we have, um, as well as the ongoing um, you know, education efforts and, and work around waste minimisation. This is an incredibly complicated uh, challenge um, and the implications for any of these decisions are significant um, and I look forward to 
uh, the full and, and frank feedback we'll get from our community as we progress through the, uh, the public consultation uh, phase um, in September, uh, what a time uh, to be having a, a rational conversation around the future of uh, core council business. Um, but I mean, just, just lastly though, and, and I referred to some of the comment, uh, public comment that's been made in response to this agenda going out, I, I don't think um, we have, there are a number of options and permutations that are available. And I don't think it's helpful um, before council have made any decisions around defining what it is that we want to do and we want to deliver um, for, um, for elected members to be plucking figures out of thin air um, to focus people's or distract from um, what should be a more open-ended conversation. Uh, to say nothing of the suggestion that uh, anyone other than elected members around this table have uh, the responsibility for setting the budgets for this organisation uh, and the ability to amend budgets for this organisation, including the inclusion of and removal of items uh, from our long-term plan. And I think it's uh, unfair on staff uh, actually to make those sorts of suggestions when that is uh, a pretty fundamental part of our job as governors of this organisation. Thank you. Any other speakers? Councillor O'Malley. I want to thank staff for this report. I also want to comment on my comments about the timing of this as we go forward. And I, I do not see any staff at the table today who are involved with why we are coming to this point right now. So I don't in any way criticise the existing staff here today. And I actually like very much working with you, Mr Henderson, as we head forward. I see us facing two challenges. One is, um, or two phases as we move forward. Um, dealing with an acute issue. We, do, we are running out of time at Green Island, um, and as you pointed out, we may end up facing a point where there will be a gap between our ability to deal with anything that comes to us at Green Island and establishing a new facility. Just touching on pulling numbers out of thin air, I just have the Transways report here to the establishment of the Cape Valley um, landfill, which I acknowledge is substantially bigger, but was put together in 2005 with an establishment cost of 75 million and a lifespan cost of 165 million. So that's not thin air, and I'm not going to sit on this any further, but the number that we're facing is not 10 million. It's going to be a big number. Now, as we head on, we have to consider that while exporting rubbish might be an anathema and an insult to our ideals, we have a situation where we have run out of time. And if we cannot sort out a way to do it, simply denying that we're going to, to sit stuff away is not an answer. So I'm hoping that won't happen. I implore staff to get moving on this. I give you all my backing. And um, I look forward to how you're going to trans transition from where we are now to a good future. Thank you. Your Worship. Yeah, I just want to pick up on um, <coughs> Councillor Hawkins' comment about product stewardship, because I think there's a connection between the potential and product stewardship schemes and extending, potentially extending the life of the landfill. And I note that um, Councillor Hawkins quite rightly pointed out that product stewardship is where central government um, puts in place a scheme where the, the, the manufacturer takes responsibility for the, the, the lifetime cost of things. But actually it enables us all to take responsibility. Because by adding a few dollars to the cost of something up front, you can then enable it to be uh, disposed of in a constructive way and can be diverted from the waste stream. So uh, it's a plea really to, to central government to get cracking on product stewardship, because apart from all the other benefits, if we, the more we divert stuff out of our waste stream, the less waste we have and the more efficiently we're using the facilities that we have. And that may enable us to solve the problems that Councillor O'Malley has talked about, um, about the, the, the life of the, land, the landfill looming up on it, the, the end of life of it looming up. So I see these things as connected. And I, um, I just wish we'd been, I can recall <coughs> pleas for product stewardship schemes 10 years ago. And we've had successive governments just saying, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I wonder who should do something about it. Well, central government's the only one that can do something about it because it, the, these products, in a small country, the products are sold nationally, and that's where it starts. So I think that we could solve a, a, a 
or at least address a range of problems, uh, not least our own around the life of our own landfill with some, with some product stewardship. Any other people wish to speak to it? I'd just like to follow up. I bought a product this week, and I don't usually like to give personal experiences of a, a chemical which cost me almost as much for the chemical as for the container, yet I know that I will get that money back. when I, It's $25 I will deposit on a container for chemicals. And that's really clever, smart selling because it's not going to go to the landfill. No dregs of that product, which is, it wouldn't be particularly good in the landfill, will go there. Um, and, and it incentivises everyone as we used to be, some of us anyway, maybe not Mr Hawkins, with the 10 cent um, bottle returns. Um, so um, I, I think we're in a very good place to be changing um, people's behaviour by companies joining better with councils to come up with much um, better environmental results. So um, fortuitous, um, while I understand the difficulties and the angst of timing for the um, report and the progress on the um, landfill, I actually think we're in a much better space to make decent decisions and it is going to be a very, very complicated discussion with the community, um, which will take some time. And I think that is the conversation we should be focusing on rather than um, putting up figures that will only alarm people. Uh, do you wish to exercise your right of return? Reply. Only to reassure the Chair that um, not only am I familiar uh, with reusable bottle schemes, um, I'm an active participant in one for the supply from our local dairy, so it's fine. The generational gap uh, is lost on me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm now talking about the quarterback. Light relief for you, Mr. Henderson. Mr. Saunders, you've got us for another few matters. Transport activity report for the two quarters ending with the 31st of December 2018, item 10. Do you wish to speak to your report? No, I will just take questions. Uh, take questions, thanks. Take questions. Any questions on Mr Saunders' report? There are no questions. I'm happy to... Uh, sorry, Councillor Elder. So the, uh, if we look at the lines there, the red line is the forecast cleans for this financial year. The purple line, which is much higher, reflects the first year of the contract where we asked the contractor to clean every tank in the city. We now run it on a program where they keep them at a specific standard. Um, so that's why there's a significant difference between the two lines. Uh, thank you. Um, Richard, um, paragraph 30, minor improvement projects. Um, a number of these projects are candidates for a high subsidy rate of an additional 20%. So what sort of percentage is that now taking us to? Uh, so delivered within this financial year, that would be 76%, um, 75 next year, 74 the year after. So, so, council, uh, so council paying 24% and NZTA paying 76? That's correct. Four, four projects that qualify. We're waiting to hear back on a decision, but we have submitted a, a plan of our f uh, forecasted safety works to try and um, make the most of that subsidy while it's available. I was going to say, you're mm. spending some accelerating some projects. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Gary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr Saunders, I wondered if you could just speak to the um, two things. First is around the um, dangerous TMP audit, item 17 on page 72. Um, <clears throat> could you just um, speak to that and explain it a little more? Yes, yeah, certainly. So we have, um, or a number of our staff, both maintenance, uh, maintenance team, the capital team and, and the asset team who um, deal with traffic management or, or work sites, um, will audit sites when they're out, out and about, which is where those numbers come from. Uh, mm -hmm. In this case, the one in October that was uh, dangerous just lacked a, a number. There's a, there's a point scoring system. Um, you assess it, allocated points for issues, and depending on the number of points, um, that, that's the, the rating that site gets, if you like. Um, in this instance, um, it was bad enough that it needed to be dealt with immediately by the contractor. In some instances, it can be uh, minor issues that can be dealt with. Uh, so this one, um, 
appropriate lack of an appropriate tape of vehicles is the, the time between where the cones start, for example, and then where the work site is to make sure vehicles have enough time to, to move to get out of the way, and then lack of appropriate signage. So that, that could could have been speed signs, um, work site signs. So our staff will just stop and work through that process. There's a, there's a templated form that they use, uh, work through that with the, the team on site, and then either take action immediately in the worst cases or, or leave that with them um, for feedback. So how do you, how quickly are you able to respond to public complaint around perceived dangerous situations in traffic management areas? Uh, we, we have a number of staff, so it seem, if, if we get a call through that seems to be of significant concern, then we, we have staff out on the network all the time. The other thing we can do is we have a record of all the traffic management plans that are granted. Uh, there is a city-wide traffic management plan for the maintenance contract, um, but we can always contact who is responsible for that site, and in the first instance, get one of their senior staff or traffic manager and operators out there as well to assess it, and then we can follow that up with staff um, when they can get there. And on the health and safety uh, matter, still theme, still pay, um, item 21 on page 73 about the burn kits. Um, it says at the very bottom of item 22, it's expected the contractor will address these issues the following month. I would have thought burn kits should be yeah, sorry, there uh, immediately, and, uh, but it's yeah. checked the following month. Oh, I see. So they, right, they, so they have to it was a it was a concern, and I spent some time with um, with the Downer management after the December results, just talking through that. They obviously take that very seriously. It's a core part of their business, so that was a a result that they were um, wanting to make sure they addressed. They I did go back and check this. They did. They were 80 per cent October, 90 per cent in November, and, and pre the previous month's health and safety had been, they, they had scored well, this particular audit didn't. Um, there were issues with the sites that were audited. Um, in January, they're back up at um, 70 per cent. There was, there was again some issues picked up. We do a very thorough health and safety audit from an independent contractor, uh, and, and that helps both ourselves, but also the, the contractor just to improve the standards. So uh, they certainly addressed the issues noted in the December, Report, and then there are a couple of other ones that have been picked up, which they'll they'll work through as well. So it's a continuous improvement exercise. Thank you. And my final question is around item 24, financial connection. Um, the uh, you obviously have a plan for when there's an emergency, and I witnessed that being rolled out uh, really well by Fulton Hogan's staff. Really impressed to get an ambulance through, um, and the way they dealt with people in the in the queue, if you like. Um, could you talk about how often have we had to implement that and, and, and how are the issues going? Are there many issues? Are you happy with the smoothness of how that's all running in terms of that project? Uh, as far as the first question goes, I'm, I'm not aware of exactly how many times Fulton Hogan have stepped in to assist. They, they obviously have a significant area of the peninsula under their jurisdiction, if you like, mm. and they, they know our maintenance contractor well enough that they can work together if there is a problem, make sure one of them is responding. There's, we don't want the, the contractors tripping over each other. Mm. So um, that one I know was dealt well through feedback from yourself and also externally. Um, that, that, that's what was a significant incident, was well handled. Uh, the project itself is, is going well. We, we were expecting, potentially expecting more issues with disruption on stage two, but the community have been very receptive and I think the traffic management, management has been handled very well. So even in the busy season, as we've had, um, we haven't had, or I haven't had, um, escalated through to me significant issues with wait times. Uh, I think we're seeing the benefit of having a single contractor responsible for all the sites along the, the road rather than multiple contractors because they can coordinate it themselves. So there's been a learning from yeah. them. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you. <clears throat> In respect of the peninsula, just following on from that comment, I think uh, whoever's responsible is in line for considerable congratulations on the way that work has been done, what we see of the final product and um, and the improvements that it's making to the city. But sorry, that's not a question. My question relates to the paragraphs 30 and 31 in your report, which talk about low-cost, low-risk projects, and one of those is the Stewart Street um, extension, it used to be called, um, um, refurbishment, safety, planting, whatever. Did, two things, did we ever make any progress or get any information from the community about the, the nitwit who did all the damage to the plantings? I'm not aware that we did. That would um, our 
our, my parks colleagues would have um, managed it if they did find any, but I'm not aware that we, were, we had any, right. any outcome on that. That notwithstanding, it had to be dug up anyway for the new cable. Um, and I'm wondering now that that work is, I guess, being completed uh, about the design of what's going in. Um, is it plantings or is it safety work that complies with the requirements of our policy on design and art and public infrastructure? Uh, so there is there is planting on and there's, there's a fairly significant safety improvement in terms of Kerbin Channel, which will prevent that car's ability to just cross it at grade and drive up it relatively easily. Um, so there will be curb and channel going right right down the middle. Um, so that'll be lifted and that'll allow a, a planting space, which Parks, of, Parks and Urban Design have been working with the, the transport team um, to implement that as well. So that'll be part of that package, which I think they're starting on very shortly because they'll follow Aurora down the hill and Fulton Hogan will be doing both contracts. So it's given the location, it's a pretty um, substantial arterial into... Um, one of our, or a couple of our suburbs, and, and indeed over into Cockera Valley, mm. um, can we be confident that it will be uh, an artistic addition to the streetscape? Uh, I wouldn't comment on artisticness. Well, it's just that we have a, okay, you don't have to, <laughs> uh, but we have a council policy on design and this sort of infrastructure yeah. so work. Yeah. And, and I want to know it's going to the work so all, is going to be comply yeah, with all, comply. all of our safety projects now are done in <coughs> consultation with the urban design team. So they they have an active role to play in, in the design process on all of them to make sure that they feel there's good consistency with the outcomes they're looking for across the city. Thank you. There are no other questions. I'm going to suggest that Dave, uh, Councillor Benson Pope, who's already talked to the motion to the extent of thanking um, the contractors, may wish to move it <laughs> to justify his ramble. Um, seconded, Councillor O'Malley. Ian, uh, do you wish to add anything to your preamble? <laughs> um, all in favour, please. Oh, sorry, is there anyone wish to speak to it otherwise? All in favour, please say aye. aye. Against. Carried. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to, I doubt you want to talk to item 12? No, I'm uh, happy 11, 11. 11, sorry, I've just, um, I'm happy to move item 11, I preempt that, seconded. Oh, no, you wish to just ask a question? Well, just a, it's a generic question that covers off each of the next four items, really. Um, from a process point of view, where something, and it's great to know that our literary history is being acknowledged in this way, for example, um, in Sawyer's Bay, but, uh, sorry, in, um, Moscow. in Moscow. Um, but where a road naming is consistent with council policy and indeed taken from our pre-approved list, or where a decision of the committee to approve a road stopping hasn't received any <coughs> objections by way of public notice, is there any val what is the value in it coming back to this committee for a further decision? My understanding is statutory requirement, no. but I could be wrong. I thought it had been looked at. Not a before. question for Mr. Saunders, maybe, but. Are you seeking under um, matters for the chair to have the delegations reconsidered for the next council? Thank you. Noted. <laughs> um, I've got a m mover. Uh, sorry, m you're moving. Moving 11. Seconded. I'm happy to. Oh, what? I, I, th I, th oh, I thought you would put. I thought you'd put your hand up to move it. Sorry. Okay. Goddard. Uh, any discussion? All in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, carried, thank you. Item 12. Happy to move option one. Option one, I presume. Seconded, did you get seconded? It's all over. And seconded? Yep. Thank you. Any, do you wish to talk to your motion? All in, uh, any discussion? All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried, thank you. Item 13, resolution. Second Hall. Uh, any? Do you wish to speak, to speak to any discussion? All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Oh, that was option one, I presume. Um, as per the order paper, and we're up to fourteen, aren't we? <laughs> um, the mayor has moved, seconded. Hall. Any questions? Any discussion? All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. Well, item 14A is um, I'm going to let the 
um, this be addressed by Councillor Hawkins, who raised it with me, and that's the addition of the Otago Polytechnic item, which we did at the um, agenda, setting of the agenda. And it's been pre-circulated as a motion from this council. It was done as a major item and matter of urgency because we understand a decision is going to be made this week and it's only preempted uh, by the Prime Minister on Friday. So that's reiterating the reasons why it's here for those that weren't in the room. And are you are you moving it from the chair? Um, I think I have to move it from the chair, but I'm going to give you the. Yep, yeah. yeah, se seconded. I think it's requirement under the standing orders. Okay, thank you. Um, this shouldn't take long. Uh, the the Prime Minister gave her a State of the Nation address uh, before a business audience on Friday morning, and it traversed uh, a fair amount of of ground. Um, but one of those most pertinent to um, to our community is the comments that have been made around the proposed uh, reform or restructure of the polytechnic sector. Um, the justification given that $100 million has been spent over the last four years in bailing out polytechs and the system is broken and uh, therefore the whole thing needs, uh, needs a shake-up. Um, Targo Polytechnic isn't, isn't one of those uh, for, uh, isn't one of those that has required a bailout as part of that over the last four years. Uh, and I think the real risk for us is that any um, attempt to uh, fix the rest runs the risk of um, us losing control of uh, one of the best performers uh, in the polytechnic sector. Uh, obviously, the, the city has a very strong uh, relationship, and we talk a lot about our relationship with the University of Otago, um, but uh, Otago Polytechnic is a huge asset um, for the city also, and, and is a far more a flexible and responsive uh, tertiary institution by design than the university will ever be, and has played uh, increasingly in, in recent times a very active role in helping to find uh, local solutions for the challenges that we face here, whether that's around um, preparing young people for work through their, um, their uh, uh, training programs, uh, or more recently, um, more actively involved in conversations around how we can address our, our housing challenges given the programs that they offer that are um, relevant to that. And, and I think uh, the, the, the concern is that um, that sort of responsiveness to our local context uh, will be something that may be lost in whatever um, restructural reform proposal comes out this week. We don't know what it is, um, the, the, the proposal. Um, the Prime Minister said as part of her speech that she's looking forward to working with local government and iwi in finding, uh, finding what the answer is, um, which would be welcome. Um, because as far as I know, there hasn't been a great deal of uh, a communication or conversation between government and local, central government and local government on this issue up until this point. So, you know, this represents our offer in return uh, to be a part of this conversation, uh, an active part of this conversation. And I think it's important to do this in advance of uh, that coming uh, on the, of that announcement being made, uh, and that it's a, a sign. It's a uh, it's this organisation. The City Council showing support for the Otago Polytechnic and, and offering our support to assist them in ensuring that we get uh, the best outcome for our community through whatever uh, shake-up is, uh, is being proposed. Um, the, last, uh, the last one, Clause C, um, is uh, in, a, in direct response to um, the Minister for Arts, Culture and Heritage, uh, as the Prime Minister also is, uh, making some quite pointed comments in that speech around uh, the polytech sector needing, needing to be uh, more attuned to and more responsive to the needs of business, um, which is you know, the de facto setting of tertiary education over the past 30 years, um, and I think is something that should always be resisted, particularly in a city like this where at the Otago Polytechnic, courses like design and fashion design and the School of Art are significant, um, both to that institution and in turn, in, in turn to the creative community in the city. Uh, and anything that would threaten those, I think, um, would be something that we should all be, all be uh, very uh, concerned about. Uh, I'm all for um, finding better funding models for tertiary providers, and you know, the, the, the Otago Polytechnic hasn't been without its challenges uh, in the past. So I, I'm supportive of looking at how they can be done more sustainably, but I would want to make sure that uh, any proposal um, isn't detrimental to uh, the sustainability of the Otago Polytechnic's uh, operating budget. So I welcome uh, support from colleagues uh, for this, um, and that 
and, and, and look forward to supporting uh, the Otago Polytechnic as they progress through what will no doubt be a challenging time for them as major reforms and restructures of, of any sector inevitably are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm very supportive of this, and I think we should thank our colleague for the timeliness of the alert. I, I, I don't know either um, what might be planned, but I am aware that, as most of us are, I'm sure that uh, the, focus on, the focus on tertiary education has largely been um, overblown in recent years to mean a university education at the expense of trade training and others. Uh, I'm not wishing to diminish the importance of the other healthcare training or physio or uh, the creative sectors that have just been referred to, but we are all only too aware of the, the really positive uh, collaborative relationship we have around the hospital issues with the Polytech, how they've worked um, aggressively with the Chamber uh, and with providers of various kinds to <clears throat> to assist in making sure that we do have the workforce available and how those uh, links have already been further strengthened with the secondary schools and so on throughout the wider region actually and indeed into Southland. So I think the important thing is that has been traversed already uh, that whatever the failings of the polytechnic sector which are acknowledged um, the Otago Polytechnic is not part of that failure. Uh, witness the development around its student growth, uh, the success of the new accommodation and discussions of more of the same, uh, and the development of the campus as part of other initiatives with the university. The, I think it's also important to acknowledge that the almost co-location, but the adjacence of the Polytechnic and the university are a huge advantage uh, to both institutions and to the city. Uh, and of course, the discussions that we've, we've had that led to funding for tertiary streets are just that, they're tertiary streets. They're not for one or the other institution. Uh, and indeed, I'm sure uh, that the offers that the Otago Polytechnic have already made in terms of contributing some sort of work in kind uh, however that might happen, uh, will come to fruition in due course. So I think it's good that we are making this statement, it's good that we are alerted to it, and it's important that we make sure that uh, one of our key institutions isn't threatened in any way uh, by uh, a change that may or may not be desirable that's been forced by reasons outside the city. Thank you. Uh, your, the Mayor? <coughs> your Worship? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I understand that the plans for the polytech sector may very well involve loss of independence, local independence for uh, our polytechnic. Uh, and I think that would be a great shame. As previous speakers have mentioned, this is easily the best performing polytech in the country. And but furthermore, it is of considerable importance to this council. We have an extraordinarily productive relationship with the Polytech, um, and it, ha it has a particularly productive relationship with our community, but uh, we interact with the Polytech uh, internationally as well as uh, locally. And I cite um, Sister City Cooperation. They've got some extraordinarily productive and lucrative relationships in China that they have built that we've supported them, but they've built them, so around educational collaboration, but also creative collaboration. Um, they, they've collaborated with us in the UNESCO Creative Cities area. Um, they've collaborated with us with design of streetscaping, Vogel Street uh, as an example, but also the tertiary sector co-investment. Uh, so I think I would like to suggest to the mover and second a, a fourth uh, clause that reads, uh, as, if you take the first sentence, uh, ensure any government reforms of the sector, enhance the ability of the Polytech to independently build collaborative relationships both locally and internationally. And that in addresses um, the fact that it may very well not be an independent in institution uh, henceforth and gives them that. So with the, with the permission. Yeah. Can, you, can you tell me that one? Yeah, um, <laughs> it's that last clause there. Yes. Uh, Councillor Gary. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm very supportive of the motion and the amendment. I've seen firsthand the quality of their delegations that they receive here. Uh, and the way that they have developed uh, real benefits for the city. And also what we haven't mentioned, and I thank my colleague Councillor Benson Pope for that list of, of uh, collaborations and projects, but we haven't mentioned the Wildlife Hospital. And I would suggest to you that the Wildlife Hospital initiative would not have got off the ground without that wonderful collaboration with the vet schools, so vet nursing schools. So um, there's another example. Um, our Polytechnic, Otago Polytechnic, I believe uh, is a Polytechnic showing great leadership and is associated with quality. Um, and the question I have, it's a rhetorical question to some degree, um, is I wonder if there is an opportunity for Otago Polytechnic to be held up uh, as a model of how Polytechnic should run and yet again Dunedin showing leadership in another area that we lead the way in. Thank you, Councillor Elder. Yeah, I just want to support this um, hugely because, in fact, for our young people in Dunedin, um, the Otago Polytech provides a huge amount of support, especially for those who have kind of learning difficulties. So they do a lot of prep for study. Um, they do a lot of support for their students. So it's a pathway for people who need that extra support. The interesting thing is that the success rate for the Polytech for getting people into appointment is about 90%, which is incredibly high. Um, but I, I see um, the sector might be broken, but I don't think the same fix is going to um, help people. And I'm just thinking of accessibility and having local solutions to local problems. And I think of people who cannot or find it difficult to get into tertiary institutions. And I worry about the changes coming because in fact, to empower people is to have things that are, are places that are accessible. And I, I believe that, yes, we should support this. Um, we should support the independence. And we can't say that one fix it solves everyone's problems. Thank you, Councillor Wiley. Thank you. Um, I will be supporting this as a parent of two Polytech students at the moment, with my daughter starting there today. Um, when you look around the education sector, um, one thing that has really stood out with the Polytech is the quality of the leadership and management that there is at the Polytech. Phil Kerr and his team have really um, advanced the education, not only in our city, but across the country. Um, and I think that is, if, if the other politics can understand what he's doing and bottle it, then I think they would all be in a, a far better position. And I hope this isn't going to be a case of the government dragging the top down, but actually lifting the rest to the height that our Otago politic is at. You know, we have quality students going the, through there, first class educators, and the Polytech, as we've already heard, has been a huge contributor to Dunedin in many, many ways. And touched on the Wildlife Hospital um, and many of the other things it's doing. And not only that, as quoted in the ODT in August 2013, it was a $135 million generator for our city. So um, I fully endorse uh, this motion today. Thank you. I'll um, briefly speak to the motion. I don't think anyone else wishes to. Um, I'm, I'm very supportive and I'm glad that Councillor Wiley mentioned um, the CEO, uh, Phil Kerr. I, and at a time when they're looking for a new CEO, it's important that there be some stability, so it's a, it, it's a difficult time. Um, the other one, though, is the board that have um, also assisted and I'd acknowledge um, Mrs Grant, uh, Cathy Grant, with, for her work with the board as well, and, and previous members. Um, this doesn't just affect Dunedin, it affects Central Otago where they've got the Telford, uh, so where they've got the Central um, Polytech. I would love to think that we have an eye on what help, happens for Telford as well, um, as someone who comes from a rural background now, um, and the importance of that as providing a um, learning environment. Um, but I'd also like to just... Uh, this isn't just about young people and what they've done with their flexible degrees for capable um, degrees and what that has done to provide a pathway for people who never got the opportunity that I got 
it, it's just been fabulous. Um, and you know, some people were blessed to have a chance to have an education as I was, but um, that which provides their work experience and for the people to get a degree um, and just shows some of the very, very good thinking that has come out of that Polytech. So um, very, very happy to support the amendment. Thank you, Your Worship, for adding that um, and hoping that um, more than just the council um, put their hands up to acknowledge the great work of the um, Otago Polytechnic and ensure that it um, continues to with the vision and the mission that it's got because that is what has been core to the change. Do you wish to exercise my right of reply? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I will now put the motion. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Okay. Against. Carried. Thank you. Um, the, before I go to items to the chair, and I've had one already suggested to me, I think we talked about one that was going to be raised as an item of the chair. I think it was something you said. It was road naming, etc. Thank you. Yes. Um, changing the delegation. Changing the delegation. Thank you. Um, that is it, and please, everyone, please attend at 5 p.m. Oh, sorry, as soon as this meeting's finished, the uh, workshop we've got. But yeah, have you another matter? Uh, yeah, I do. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. There was um, inclusion in the Regional Council's budget for this current financial year, um, money allocated towards doing a feasibility study for a public transport service to the airport. Uh, and I was just wondering if any of our myriad groups that interact with that body around transport issues could get a report back on whether that is progressing or how that is progressing in the, in the interim. I just haven't heard anything back from it. Well, it better go to the door because you can't go to the road and walk, um, as we all know. Councillor Benson Pope, yes, I'm happy to get, make sure that you get hear back from that. I just wanted Councilor to check, meeting. Madam Chair, that colleagues had noticed the reversal of the meeting t meetings tomorrow. Yes, thank you. Thank you. If that is all that matters, thank you very much for your attendance and for, your, and for the staff for their, for their patience. Um, please all make it to the workshop, which sounds very interesting.